Members, we're going to um, uh, convene the uh, House Committee on Criminal Justice Reform, Finance, and Public Safety. Uh, we've got a really big day uh, today. Uh, our day is going to actually be a pretty long one, so we will be recessing um, a little bit later after our regular uh, scheduled time. Uh, <clears throat> I do want to make a few uh, opening comments uh, for today, uh, recognizing some of the citizens that have joined us. Uh, here uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be hearing uh, on issues related to, well, we're going to be hearing on issues of police uh, community relations. And in some instances, with, and I know for a fact, because uh, I've met some of the families, uh, some of those uh, have resulted in pretty tragic uh, outcomes uh, for beloved uh, family members. And so I'm beginning this, this meeting acknowledging uh, the vital importance of making sure that the voices of our citizens uh, are fully heard. We're going to begin this hearing um, with hearing uh, a presentation from the Attorney General of the Department of Public uh, Safety on their, involved, on their Police Involved Deadly Force Encounters Working Group report. Um, I just want to be real clear uh, for the public that uh, here in the Minnesota Legislature, uh, this is the people's house. Uh, we are not an extension of the executive branch. We're not a part of the Attorney General's office. Uh, neither are we part of the public safety um, uh, uh, department. Obviously, we're all a part of state government. But our function here is not only to hear from the executive branch. Um, our function here is to hear from all citizens and residents uh, of this state. And so it is my intent uh, in this hearing uh, to hear from the AG and from the Department of, of Public Safety. Uh, we will not be moving um, any of their uh, uh, provisions. Uh, we do have some bills, uh, including my bill, uh, that in part uh, responds and also proactively uh, creates, uh, I would argue, um, a better way for us to build stronger, healthier, uh, safer uh, relationships uh, across law enforcement with our community members. Um, but uh, our role here today is not, uh, will not be to, to be moving on the AG or DPS's recommendations. Uh, it's to be hearing them. And uh, simultaneous, or at the same, in, in the same vein, I want to be able to hear from community members on their recommendations, their perspectives, and their thoughts. And all of that will be on the record. So it's in that spirit of sharing. Uh, with one another that, that I really want to uh, begin this, uh, this meeting. Uh, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot, uh, both from our, uh, our executive branch and AG, uh, but also I, I'm looking forward to learning a lot uh, from my, uh, my fellow residents and citizens of the state of Minnesota. Um, so with that, um, we will, uh, just so you know how we're going to process this through, this is going to be a very busy day. Uh, for this committee. Uh, my desire is to um, go through the first part of this hearing, um, hearing from the voices of, of our community members and voices uh, from DPS and uh, the AGs. Um, and then at about a quarter to two, um, I want to move, then uh, move uh, to uh, pass that sharing and listening and toward another sharing and listening, which is the presentation of the bill that uh, that I'm proposing and then debate on, on that bill uh, as well. So I will work awfully hard to make sure that there's equal time for uh, voices um, uh, on this issue. Uh, I think this committee uh, can pride itself in, in uh, having done that on a number of very difficult issues over the course of the year. And you all have our commitment uh, in the public that we will uh, keep to that. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to uh, begin our business uh, today. We have a very quick uh, item of business, uh, which is the adoption of the May, the March rather. Well, I kind of wish it was May. March 3rd uh, committee hearing, and I'm wondering if uh, Vice Chair uh, Representative Mendelson, if you would move adoption of those minutes. So moved, Chair. Very well. Is there discussion? Uh, if not, then all in favor of adopting the <coughs> minutes of March 3rd, uh, please say aye. Aye. Uh, the poll same sign. 
Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Edelson, and thank you, members. Uh, so the first item of business is a presentation um, from the Attorney General and Department of Public Safety Police Involved Deadly Force Encounters Working Group Report. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Harrington. I'm a commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Um, and I and Attorney General Keith Ellison convened a working group uh, about this time last year. The, the genesis for the idea behind this started around February, March of 2019, as both of us independently were hearing from community members who were concerned about the incidents of deadly force and officer-involved shootings involving uh, Minnesota police officers and the community. At the same time, I was also having conversations with Minnesota police officers and sheriffs and others about issues around wellness and uh, around their safety. And so we convened this working group um, with the idea that we would begin to take testimony, we would seek out the best information that was available uh, wherever it was available to try and see if there were solutions to this problem. Uh, I will note that this was, and had, as far as we can tell, uh, was the first and only time a state has ever tried to tackle this issue. Um, no other state has decided that this issue was so important that uh, the Attorney General, the Commissioner of Public Safety, and others would tackle the issue. I can also tell you that uh, we were told by many folks uh, politically much wiser than I am and uh, that this was like the third rail, uh, that this was a issue that would provoke uh, heated responses. Uh, but. The Attorney General and I in our conversation concluded that it was too important for us not to do. Uh, lives were at stake uh, and that to not tackle this issue when the Attorney General and I had the capacity and the interests and we had others who were willing to step forward with us uh, to express their interests, uh, in my mind would have been a dereliction of duty. Uh, and so we took this task on uh, and I will uh, let the, uh, the Attorney General is out of town, but I will let his, his aide uh, introduce himself and, uh, and make his opening comments. Very well, welcome to the committee, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm David Voigt. I'm a Deputy Attorney General, and uh, Attorney General Ellison uh, expresses his regrets that he was not available to be here today. Uh, but I would echo the comments of Commissioner Harrington that um, it's an issue that the Attorney General heard a lot about uh, during his campaign and during his first year in office and came in uh, committed to doing all that he could and all that the office could to address this very important problem. Um, and and so in in... In, in concert with the Commissioner of Public Safety, um, he undertook this and is committed to following up as much as he can with the recommendations. So as I mentioned, we, start, we started this working group. Uh, uh, actually, the conversation started in February, March, but we actually did most of the work from the summer through actually just a month or so ago. We were still taking testimony uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, we decided that in order to really have a working group, um, not a task force, not a, a different agency, not a blue room panel, what we really wanted was we wanted as broad a cross-section of the community and experts to be part of the working group as we possibly could get. Uh, and so we made sure that as we were recruiting people for this, we recruited folks from the community, including family members who had lost loved ones. We made sure that we had academics who had studied this topic from the U of M and from St. Thomas. We made sure that we had legislators on the, on the committee, both Rena Moran from the House and uh, Bill Ingerbritsen from the Senate were on there. Uh, we made sure that we had police voices on there, uh, representatives from the Sheriff's Association, Chiefs of Police Association, and MPPOA were, were, on, were on the committee. Uh, we made sure that we had both geographic diversity uh, and ethnic and gender diversity because we wanted to make sure that we didn't leave anybody out from the table as we were trying to get the best information possible. Uh, the working group provided a framework for a wide variety of stakeholders to provide their voice to us about what they saw as the problem 
and equally important, what they saw as solutions to the problem. Uh, one of the things that the Attorney General and I said at the very beginning, and we continue to say now, is that we did not start this with any preconceived notions about where we would end up. We didn't know if we were going to end up with a, a product that was going to say, this is how you fix it, or whether we're going to come at the end of this process of hearing uh, from frustrated community people that this was an unsolvable problem. I'm happy to report that we got a lot of feedback and brought in a lot of testimony that makes me incredibly optimistic that we can do what we set out to do, which is to reduce the number of deadly force encounters between police and community. Uh, I really am very optimistic that from this work, if we are able to make, to bring it to life and bring it into implementation, that some of the recommendations that we will, that we have made will in fact have that result. Because in fact, when we look at other departments that have done some of those things, we have seen dramatic reductions in deadly force encounters and we've seen officers feeling safer. We've seen them feeling more validated, and we've seen more community people saying that they feel safer in that environment. Uh, one of the questions that keeps coming up was, why did we call it a deadly force encounter and not an officer-involved shooting? Uh, there are several reasons, but the, the, the heart of that really speaks to some of those very high-profile cases we had during the Ferguson period of time. Uh, when we think about cases where officers shot somebody, that is certainly one category of deadly force encounter. But we also sat, saw in New York cases where officers ended up killing an individual, but it wasn't simply from shooting. And, and so whether it's uh, through the use of a motor vehicle, the use of a firearm, or through a chokehold, we felt that all of those, that whole category of use of force should be encompassed. And so the term deadly force encounters was picked because we felt it was broader than simply an officer involved shooting. Um, not all deadly force encounters are shootings, and frankly, not all shootings end up in someone killed. And so this really, we felt, gave us a broader framework than calling it the officer involved shooting uh, task force or working group. Our timeline, uh, as we said, January of 2019, we began our conversations. Uh, in March, I tasked uh, Nicole Archibald as the Community Affairs Director to begin the process of trying to figure out what would this look like. Uh, and we got a ton of good ideas from people. Uh, ideas that range from we should do a assessment of all of the old cases that had come through the state, that we should bring in subject matter experts from all over the country, uh, that we should be taking testimony uh, in all over the state of Minnesota. And we took those recommendations and built that into a work plan. Um, in July, we announced the formation of the working group. In August, we had our first hearing. Uh, and I want to mention the first hearing because I know some of the folks here today were at the first hearing. Um, I've heard from a lot of folks, uh, media folks, that called me up and asked me about, well, you know, it's a shame that your, your working group failed. And I said, based on what did you think we failed? They said, well, we saw the, the, the first hearing. I said, that first hearing was probably the most powerful community <coughs> meeting that I've ever been at. And I've been over 40 years as a cop. I've been at a lot of community meetings. Okay. This was an incredibly powerful show about the, the hurt and the anguish that losing a loved one brings on community. Uh, it was not a failure at all. It was, in fact, hearing the community, listening to them, and it, in fact, enlightened our process because from that point on, every meeting that we had started out with asking for survivors and their families to come and speak to us first. Uh, we began each meeting with survivors and members of the community that, that had, had felt this hurt. And at the end of every meeting, we closed that meeting with giving them another opportunity to provide testimony so that we made sure that community's voices were heard, not just once, uh, but they were heard. They bracketed our process, and they, in fact, enlightened our process throughout. Uh, so we had hearings <laughs> there. We met all over the state of Minnesota from here in St. Paul to Mankato to Cloquet. Uh, we had hearings in South Minneapolis or listening sessions in South Minneapolis and Worthington and Bemidji. Uh, we traveled the state to make sure that any place that there might have been 
someone who wanted to testify, that we could make it as easy as possible for them to testify. We met late into the evenings on listening session nights in, ho in high school cafeterias and college auditoriums. We wanted to make sure that we were, were being as inclusive and as open to testimony as we possibly could be. In February, we had our final deliberation. We had 28 recommendations that came out of that deliberation. I know that most of you have that. 33 action steps were then announced as part of that. Uh, and then we expect in about a month from now, we will have a final report. Uh, part of the process of developing that report was also a very transparent process. Every hearing was videotaped and live streamed so that if anybody that couldn't come to the meeting wanted to see what was going on, they simply had to tune in. Uh, all of that data is available and will be made available. So it is a transparent process of, that every conversation, every piece of testimony was, is available for review by you or by the public if, as they wish. Uh, and this final report, we believe, will be an inclusive report. But, and, I, and this is a, a major but, and it's one, once again, that the Attorney General and I have both said over and over again, that report is the start of implementation. The fact that we've wrapped up the, the meetings only means that the meetings are done. The real work now begins with you and with community and with others to actually move from theoretical into real, from ideal into practical. So that is that report that is going to come out is, in fact, a report that, in fact, we think of as the next beginning of the journey. Uh, the purpose of the working group, I've already sort of talked about, identify areas of common ground among stakeholders and what, trying to figure out what are actionable steps that would reduce officer-involved shootings. And also, just as important, could we improve the state's response to them? In my heart, what I would like to see is less dead people. Bottom line, plain spoke, that's what I really would like. But I'm not, an, I'm not an idealist, so I don't believe that in the world that I live in that I can completely stop officer-involved shootings from happening. There are circumstances where it is simply the only viable choice. I wish it wasn't, but that's the world that I live in today. So if it is the only viable choice, then what I then need to make sure I focus on is, is justice then given in the aftermath of that choice? Have we made a transparent system so that as policymakers, as attorneys, and as judges are brought in to make decisions about this, that they are able to do it with the best possible information, the best possible evidence, so that justice, in fact, is being served. We talked about it being a statewide effort uh, because partly one of the things that I learned early on in this is that, frankly, while we hear about deadly force encounters here in the Twin Cities a lot, 60% of them happen in greater Minnesota. And so moving out to greater Minnesota became important because just talking to the folks in the Twin Cities, while it would have been an important first step, it would not give it and given us really a statewide perspective on this. <coughs> Question about why it's a working group and not a task force. Um, we really did believe that a working group allowed us the flexibility to bring people in. And in fact, we started out with 16 different people in, and in no part, no part because of the conversations we had at the first meeting, we brought in somebody who had an expertise in mental health. Uh, we brought in folks that had more expertise in autism and mental health. And so we made sure that we were being responsive, even to the things that we heard on the fly, to make sure that the working group mirrored what we were hearing from community as to what they thought a working group should look like. Members of the working group, ultimately, well, there were 18 of them. We selected them. We recruited them. And I will tell you... Um, when I had the phone call stations, I was making cold calls to people saying, we're going to take on officer-involved shootings and deadly force encounters, and we'd like you to sit at the table with us to do that. There was a noticeable pause on the other end of the phone on a number of those conversations as people thought, why would I do that? And we were able to convince them 
philanthropists, community people, com families, uh, academics, advocates, legislators, that this was so important that they should give up literally many, many days of their summer and fall and into the winter to make sure that we were on the right track. Uh, the Attorney General and I co-chaired this and sort of alternated in terms of trying to, trying to keep things on track and keep things on schedule, uh, which oftentimes was challenging. I want you to imagine a mom testifying about the loss of her son or a wife testifying about the loss of her husband. How do you tell them that they have five minutes left? How do you tell them that, well, we're out of time now and you got to go? Uh, we frankly couldn't. Uh, and so if the testimony rolled on, it rolled on. Uh, and, and at some point, we sort of would sort of gauge from our own sort of emotional intelligence level to say, okay, I think they, they've said all they can say. Uh, but a lot of the testimony we had ended with moms and dads and sisters and brothers in tears at the testifier table uh, because they were remembering for them the last day of their loved one's life. Uh, and so it was a working group that we tried to, con tried to make sure it stayed on schedule, but frankly, uh, it rolled on and we ended up with more meetings because we needed more meetings and longer time in order to hear from the voices of the people that wanted to talk to us. We held four hearings I mentioned, St. Paul, Mankato, Cloquet, and Brooklyn Park. Um, we had three listening sessions, South Minneapolis, Bemidji, and Worthington. Uh, 50 different witnesses, not including the affected families who testified at each hearing. Uh, we recognize that this is a tough issue. It's a tough issue for me. It's a tough issue for the moms and the families. It's a tough issue for the community. It's a tough issue for you. Uh, and we recognize that, that we needed to be sympathetic uh, and open to that on both sides of, the, of that equation. It was not a one-sided conversation. Uh, it needed to, we needed to hear from them, and we also needed to hear from the experts that we brought in from all over the country to tell us about how could we not only do a better job with this, but how could we start fixing it. Uh, we organized around four themes initially. Uh, one of the first questions that we got from the community, including from that first meeting, was questions about who investigates deadly force encounters. How is that done? Who should do that? Uh, and so we heard from them about their concerns about the BCA doing it. We heard from them their concerns about the local police departments doing it. We heard from their concerns about sheriff's departments doing it. Um, we heard their concerns, and we heard from others that con were concerned about the federal government and their involvement in it. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we were listening to them about investigations. We listened to them about who should be, where is the oversight for those investigations, and how should accountability be placed. Uh, we moved on from there to talk about prevention. How would we prevent this? Um, what kind of training should officers have uh, and first responders have? And we talked about officer wellness because we know that in so many cases, being involved in an officer-involved shooting is the last good day that an officer has. We can tell you about the cases of post-traumatic stress disorder and officers retiring early because this was nothing that they had ever intended to do when they joined the police department, the sheriff's department, or the BCA, or, or any of the federal agencies. Uh, so we recognize that wellness is a necessary piece of this because in order for officers to go out and do the job, we need to make sure that they are healthy officers. And in fact, that was one of the things the community said to us over and over again, is that they didn't want sick officers out there on the streets after something bad had happened. We looked at policy and the legal implications. The lawyers got heavily engaged in conversations about who should, who should, uh, who should be the charging authority, who should be the oversight authority. Uh, and we worked through that with county attorneys and the AG's office and federal judges and local judges trying to make sure that we were on the right track. And then our last real theme was, as we, as we recognized from the conversations, that how do you heal a community after someone that they loved has been torn from them? How do we do that? And not less importantly, but also it was a theme that came through loud and clear through us. How does the policing, how do peace officers interact with those who are in mental health crisis? Uh, one of the things that we heard, one of those aha moments for me was that 50% of the deadly force encounters that happen in the state of Minnesota 
happen with somebody who's in the middle of a mental health crisis. At 50%, that should speak loud and clear that there has to be a better or a different vehicle for interacting with those that are in mental health crisis simply other than simply sending the police. And we will give you a short story about that in a bit. Ultimately, we organize our recommendations around the ones I talked about, community healing and engagement, prevention and training, investigations and accountability, policy and legal implications, and officer wellness. Community, was, community healing and community trust was really first and foremost among the things that we thought about. Uh, if there is no community trust, then there is no basis for civil law enforcement and civil policing. Uh, and so we had to begin having a conversation about how do we, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, and many, and when we talked to folks in greater Minnesota, they have very trusting relationship with their department. We talked to a lot of folks and they said things were very well done there. And other communities, they said not so much. That there wasn't a great deal of trust between them and the policing authority that, that, that oversaw them. And that that was an area that they really wanted to see work done. Uh, how do you heal that wound became part of our conversation. And then once again, we ended with the idea of how do we make sure that our cops, the people that we employ and send out to do this work, are healthy and well, both before, during, and after a deadly force encounter. We used a criteria to try and limit this, because at some points, as you can kind of guess, this could have simply been everything that has ever happened in policing under a, a microscope. And we said, first of all, we had to think about, does it fall within the mandate of the working group? So we weren't necessarily looking at every police encounter. We weren't looking at every time a cop got in, in a, made an arrest. We weren't looking at complete body of legal pro like legal precedent around police officers. We were trying to focus on the worst case scenario, which is that deadly force encounter. We recognized that we were going to focus on things that were likely to have an impact on deadly force encounters, not necessarily stop you know, uh, traffic stops or stop how people were held in custody in jails. That was beyond the scope of the working group. We wanted it to be actionable. And, and several of the conversations I had with moms uh, oftentimes came down to if not the police, then who? Who at 2 in the morning will show up at the psychiatric hospital to handle the out-of-control patient when the doctors and the psychiatric nurses have said they can't do anything else? And the hospital has called 911. Who else is going to show up there? Uh, who else is going to show up at the house when the family members call and say, our son is out of control and he's hurting people? Who else, would, who else is on the line? I don't know of anybody else that will make come from 911 that will show up at 2 o'clock in the morning or at 2 in the afternoon to do that. Uh, and so we talked about it had to be actionable in, in our mind if we were going to do this. It couldn't simply be an ideal, although frankly in our recommendations there are some ideals in there. Uh, that we said, if there were funding, if there was the will from the, from the legislature to do, uh, we could easily see ourselves having an entirely different investigatory operation. Uh, it doesn't exist currently. It doesn't mean it couldn't exist. Uh, and we talked to folks at the federal government who have created a similar edifice for federal cases. And finally, uh, our, we wanted to make sure that our working group recommendations would address both the community's concerns and police concerns. It couldn't be one or the other, uh, because if it's, if it's all on one side or the other, it's not actionable, and it won't build the trust, and it won't be successful if we don't make sure that both bodies' voices are heard. Uh, many of the recommendations, as you look through them, designate my agency to initiate and move forward. Uh, th that was a question we got at the last press conference. Well, who's going to do this? And I'm happy to stand here in front of you or sit here in front of you and say, I will. Uh, if, it's, if, 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 it, if there's any way it can fit within DPS's mandate, DPS is happy to continue the work. Uh, in fact, we want to continue the work. We, in fact, will insist on being a party to the work as we move this forward. It is, it is not something that I will shirk, and in fact, it is something that I welcome because I really do believe we can do better. Uh, other recommendations designate things that we want the legislature to consider, uh, whether it's a change in law, a change in policy, or a change in funding. 
Um, and we also recognize that tribal and local governments will also have to take some, have to take some actions. There was a recommendation about body cams that, that we talked about as to whether body cams should be for everybody in the state of Minnesota. And it was rightfully pointed out that local communities get to make that decision based on the law that we created around body cams. It, that had to be something that the local jurisdiction, the local community, the local elected officials had insight and had some say-so in. So while I think body cams are a wonderful thing, I'm not in a position to dictate, dictate that to a local unit of government, whether it's a, a local city, a township, or even a county. Uh, I can make recommendations, but we recognize that the local Local control is still at play here. Uh, some recommendations indicate that uh, named stakeholders should continue a dialogue. There were, there were concerns about what should the Attorney General do on some of these cases, and we recognize that given the current way the law is written, Attorney General may or may not have any legal right to be involved in some of these cases. Uh, and so a conversation between the county attorneys and the Attorney General needs to continue to decide where, does, where is that best served, uh, and then Finally, our recommendations were geared to decrease police involved deadly encounters. Uh, that is for me really, that was my, that was where I started with this and it's still where I'm at with this right now. Uh, what I want is I want less shootings. I want less bad outcomes for the community. I want less bad outcomes for the cops. I want, I want less people injured and hurt and killed uh, and I believe that the work we're doing that we propose brings us to that. Couple of the aha moments. Uh, where do most deadly force encounters occur? Not in the Twin Cities. They occur in greater Minnesota, uh, which was something that almost nobody we talked to uh, knew until we brought uh, actual hard data in to start looking at where do they occur and trying to figure out, well, what do we know about them? And one of the recommendations you'll see in here is to try and make sure that the BCA as a data collection agency is told about <laughs> all deadly force type encounters so that we will do a better job of recognizing the trends and being able to get, out of front, get in front of those. The other aha moment for me was that whole issue about when a person is, cri is in crisis, over 50% of them, that's when we have a deadly force encounter. And so at that point, if it's 50%, we began to ask the question, well then, wouldn't co-responder models, similar to what Minneapolis and St. Paul and Duluth and others are already doing, shouldn't we look at those to see how effective have they been in reducing deadly force encounters? Is that in fact a model that should be in fact pushed out statewide? Uh, given that aha moment, it strikes me that if I was a parent of a child who had mental health or a relative of someone who had mental health issues, I would want to know that the best and the brightest were coming to help. Uh, not that the police are not coming to help, but the police have a certain set of tools. I'd want to make sure the people that have the best tools are there at my house when I am most in need. And so that became one of our aha moments. Another aha moment for me was that there are departments around this country that have in fact taken this on, on an individual department basis, and that they're having incredibly high levels of success. I went out recently to Camden, New Jersey. Uh, Camden, it's now the Camden County Police Department. We had a, an hour-long presentation from Captain Lutz from there, uh, but I went out to actually spend a couple days there to try and find out what they were doing. Uh, I went down and saw the, the magic 360 degree simulator that they use and watched them run people through scenarios. Scenarios were folks that were in mental health crisis. Scenarios where people were barricaded. Scenarios where people were pointing guns and watch them drill with their officers how to make these encounters end with everybody walking away. Uh, one of the things that was unique about that, and it happened while I was there, is that they are hypersensitive to this. And so any use of force that is questioned by the sergeant or the watch commander is then funneled to their training unit and literally the case I saw, a young man who had had a use of force on a traffic stop, not a deadly force encounter, a use of force encounter, they were having him run through that traffic stop on the simulator the day after the traffic stop. From a, an adult education perspective, we know that the immediacy of the training is absolutely essential if you're going to change behaviors. 
that to wait a year for in-service training to happen to then talk about why this was a bad tactic on a traffic stop doesn't change that young man's behavior. And the message that went out to all the rest of the officers in the department was that if you screw up, they're going to help you get better. Uh, they will hold you accountable. Uh, but one of the things that was notable about this was that the two groups that were applauding this, the New Jersey ACLU, not oftentimes thought of as a big proponent for police, uh, but in this case, they were a major proponent for this approach, and the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police. Their police union president is one of the people that sets up the training and works with them to make sure the training happens. I'm not sure if you get two more disparate groups at the table, but the, together they said they were training Camden officers to do policing the way they believed it should be. And the way they believe it should be is highlighted by a principle that they have really pushed out. And that principle is that life is precious. And that police encounters, whenever possible, should <coughs> end with the goal to have everybody walk away intact. And they, they preach and train distance and cover and time and de-escalation, and they train it and they drill it to the point that they have had a 95% reduction in complaints about excessive force. And their deadly force encounters, and they were at one time, Camden, for those that know, you know, the United States, was noted as the most dangerous city in the United States for a number of years. They had one of the highest murder rates and they had a really high rate of officer-involved deadly force encounters. And that has plummeted to two or three in a year. I looked at that and went, that's an aha moment that's worth going and visiting. That's an aha moment that's worth looking at. What are the options of bringing that kind of training and that kind of an approach to Minnesota? Would we be better off if we could say we've had a 95% reduction in excessive force complaints? Would we be better off if we went from 40 deadly force encounters to three as a state? To me, that sounds like we're all safer, uh, and that's a goal that's worthwhile pursuing. We have some things that are a work in progress. One of the things that we looked at early on was, uh, and this came out of, I think, our very first hearing, was come, hearing from families who said they did not get the support they needed after the fact. Uh, they, they felt like the officer or the detective who was handling their case was also responsible for trying to keep them informed and advised of progress on the case, answering their questions, and trying to be kind of the victim advocate for them at the same time that they were doing the case. Uh, they said one of the things that would be most useful to them was they wanted a victim family liaison. I didn't need, I didn't need to bring that to you. We could do that in-house. And so we immediately after the first hearing began the process of creating the job description, uh, creating the budget, uh, and in fact, we have hired our first family victim liaison already. Uh, so that person is already in place. As we have officer-involved shootings in the state of Minnesota from here on out, there will be somebody, there will be a voice on the phone, an ear to listen to, a caring person who will help them negotiate as they have to go through this process. The other piece, one of the other pieces that was asked for for us was, uh, in fact, it was Valerie Castile who asked us to modify the instructions in our driver's license manual so that people that are, have a permit to carry would know what the proper procedure would be when they're stopped by the police. We've already drafted that. We are working with subject matter experts to make sure that it's completely vetted. And that's something, once again, we don't need the legislative authority to do. That is something, once we've gotten the right subject matter experts involved, we can simply do. Uh, and that is something we will do, and I expect that will happen in the short term. As I conclude this, I just want to thank two people. Uh, I want to thank Nicole Archbald, who is the Director of Community Affairs at the Department of Public Safety. Um, she was the person who I tasked with this work. Uh, she arranged the speakers and got the venues and made sure that, that the, the videotape was working and that the, the documents were there and that 
people's phone calls got answered. And she's done an amazing, amazing job with this. The other person, and this is a person she brought in, was Ron Davis. Ron Davis is the past director of the COPS office. Uh, as the community policing office. He was appointed by President Obama to run the 21st Century Policing Task Force uh, that resulted in the, the president's recommendations on 21st century. Uh, he was our lead consultant as we came into this work to say, how would we organize this? How would we document it? And how would we prepare a report so that it would be a living document ready for implementation and not simply a report that would be sitting on a shelf? That concludes my prepared remarks, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Commissioner and uh, Deputy Attorney General, thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is to ask um, the uh, members of the public who came uh, prepared to comment um, and take their, uh, their thoughts, um, and then uh, circle back to both them and as well as you two for questions uh, from the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if those, um, if those folks can come forward. Now, there's plenty of seats up there, so feel free to uh, fill those in. And then there's a couple of seats also on the side that you can kind of use um, to just so that you're in the vicinity and then you can swap out with, you know, whoever's already testified. That way we'll, we'll keep a good flow going. So welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry? Welcome to the committee. Thank you oh. for being here. Thank you. And please, when you start your comments, if you can just uh, state your name. That way we'll get it on the record. And, and not only that, but then I'll also know how to address you as, course, as we talk. Chair Mariani and uh, members of the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee, thank you for having us today. My name is Michelle Gross, and I am president of the organization Communities United Against Police <coughs> Brutality. We are a police accountability organization that is now in our 20th year, and um, I'm here representing the interests of roughly 14,000 members and supporters of our organization. We provide advocacy for police brutality, for uh, survivors of police brutality, and the family members of people who have died from police violence. We also engage in policy work to change the underlying causes and conditions that allow police brutality, misconduct, and abuse of authority to occur. We engage in research so that our recommendations that we put forward come from evidence-based best practices. I have personally worked on police accountability issues for over 30 years. And my specialty that I work in now uh, is primarily with families of people who have been killed by police, and I provide them with support and information and assistance as they need. And a lot of the folks sitting here are people that I've actually worked with over the years. Um, we are deeply con uh, concerned and deeply disappointed in the anemic recommendations that have come out of this working group. You should have in front of you, hopefully at this point, um, a report that we wrote that critiques the, these uh, recommendations in detail. And so my expectation is that you um, should have that in front of you. This was given to your, um, to one of the aides to yeah, provide those to have, you. Uh, been distributed, uh, so members should all have those in front of them. Great, thank, thank you, you very so much. much, I appreciate that. This working group was an opportunity, a serious opportunity to address a serious issue. But with the composition of this working group, starting out primarily as 70% law enforcement, and absolutely no experts from the community in the police accountability arena, and no members of any families who had lost a loved one to police that did not get justice. The composition of this working group essentially ensured the kinds of results that we're seeing today. It's, a, it's deeply disappointing, I just have to tell you. Um, and one of the other things that we, that we note is that this composition led to the uh, recommendations being predicated on politics and appeasement, not actual solutions. The recommendations that were presented to you are generally not measurable. They will not affect the underlying causes that lead to police deadly force. They will not curtail such incidents in any meaningful way. And some actually outright harm the community by making it even harder to hold law enforcement officers accountable. And I'll give you some examples of that momentarily. The community attempted to make our wishes known long ago. 
In March 2019, long before the formation of this work group, our organization sent a letter to A.G. Ellison offering to share with him our findings, excuse me, our findings that we discovered through the reinvestigation of a number of deadly force incidents. I bring with me today one of the reports that we developed over a year's time that outlines and details the flaws in the BCA's investigation of the Thurman Blevins case. We have investigated a number of other cases and have similar findings. However, despite sending our letter in March 2019, we heard nothing from the AG's office until the very day that he announced the composition of this working group. And on that day, we were invited that we might have a meeting with his office at some point in the future. Once we saw, however, the composition of this working group, we pretty much knew the fix was in. And so at that point, we declined meeting with him to share our great details of these <coughs> investigations. Nonetheless, despite our disappointment in trying to, attempting to work with A.G. Ellison, the community came together yet again, and we crafted a set of recommendations that actually addressed the underlying causes of police-perpetrated deadly violence. And these, um, we presented these to the work group on the first day, at the very first hour of their first meeting. We also submitted our recommendations via their online portal. We wanted to make sure that they got our recommendations. However, it is clear from these final recommendations that our document and our recommendations were largely ignored. From, from this flawed process came flawed recommendations. We prepared a report critiquing these recommendations, which you have in front of you, but I want to call out two very specific recommendations. Recommendation 3.1 calls for increased funding for the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to create some kind of special unit to investigate police perpetrated killings, despite their well-known history of slipshod, biased investigations into these killings. The community is fed up with one law enforcement agency investigating another. We are utterly fed up. And even worse, this is the law enforcement agency that is above all other law enforcement agencies. They work with these other agencies on a day-by-day -day basis, and they are simply incapable of providing an unbiased investigation into these matters. Recommendation 3.2 is really just a mushy statement about the AG's office continuing to work with county prosecutors on prosecutors, prosecutions in these cases. We have already seen the result of this. To date, there have been only four prosecutions of officers involved in killing members of the community in the history of the state of Minnesota. We have had four. The fourth is happening right now. We have only had four, and these have only happened in recent years. So we've already seen the result of this kind of um, alliance. And I should say the result or lack thereof. What is actually needed is an agency that is independent of law enforcement and that would be tasked with both investigating and prosecuting police perpetrated deadly force incidents. Such an agency was in fact proposed by Senator Scott Dibble uh, in uh, some previous legislative sessions, I believe roughly three to four years ago. This proposal should be brought forward again and should be passed by this legislature. There are a number of other community recommendations that did not make it into a work group's report. They are listed in the critique that you've gotten, but I would like to specifically call out two of them. First is the recommendation to end fear-based training such as bulletproof, formerly called bulletproof warrior, um, those kinds of trainings. It is hard to imagine why this work group ignored the large base of evidence that demonstrates the role this training plays in causing deadly force incidents. Minneapolis has already banned this training, and it should be banned everywhere across the state. We have been working for three years to try to get the post board to ban this training. You folks have the power to make that happen. Secondly, we recommend the end of, uh, the, to end the practice of police-only responses to mental health crisis calls. While co-response is a good recommendation, it is not enough. Every county in the state currently has a mobile mental health crisis team, every single county. I don't know if you're aware of that, but every county has that. Most such calls should be deflected by way of dispatch triage directly to those teams. And, those, and only in situations where there is a weapon or potential violence should there be a police response, and that should only be a co-response. Minneapolis handled 15,000 calls that they call EDP calls, emotionally disturbed person calls. 
only a few involved a weapon or danger. Virtually all of those calls, except for the ones involving weapon or danger, could have been handled outside of the police department and should have been. And as um, the uh, public safety commissioner stated, 50% of deaths at the hands of, uh, of law enforcement officers results from a mental health crisis call. It is sad that a work group that the work group failed to incorporate the community's sound and well-researched recommendations because their failure represents yet another squandered opportunity to address a problem that is of deep concern to the community. I hope that you will do what the work group failed to do. That is, take up the community's recommendations in your own legislative session. I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Gross. Thank you. Um, and next. My name is Tashira Garraway. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Garraway. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I am the fiance and the mother of Justin Tigan, who was brutally beaten and thrown in a dumpster by the St. Paul Police Department. Today, we talked about uh, Harrelton, whom was the chief of police when my son's father was put in the dumpster by the St. Paul police. Drew Evans, who was the head of the BCA when my son's father was thrown in a dumpster. My son's father murder was the 2009 Emmett Till. Carlos, you've seen the pictures of how brutally my son's father was beaten. We talked about the officers being afraid. Justin did run. My thoughts is that it was fear. What happened to Justin, and if you all seen the pictures, was clearly a hate crime. I sit before you with Jamar Clark's sister, who was handcuffed when he was brutally shot in the back of his head. Jefford Smith's mom, who her son was shot 52 times by the St. Paul Police Department. Monique, who nephew was killed by St. Paul Police Department. I need you guys as human beings to take our recommendations as the families and as the people living in the communities, we are the experts. We have been impacted the most. The working group collected their data, their analysis, but we have lived it. I have lived in fear of my own life for fighting for my son's father, for justice. The St. Paul police has followed me. They've sat outside my home for hours. They've sat outside Justin's mother's home. They've waved at me, rolled their windows down. I will never forget as I came out of the store and waved at me while I had my three-year-old that I was putting in the car. Because like any normal human being, I was fighting for justice for my loved one who they took away from me. The recommendation that I have today is that this, there is no statute of limitation on wrongful death. Three years is the statute of limitation currently. They held the case open. So when three years rolled around, I was no longer able to go back for those damages. I have a 13-year-old son that I have to provide for. We had to scrape up money because they leave us with nothing. There's no, we don't qualify for the Crime Victims Justice Unit. When the police murder our loved ones, we're left to scrape up the money to bury our loved ones after they murder them in cold blood. And then the harassment starts if you're fighting for the truth. These families will testify and they will bring forth 
the same truth as I'm bringing. Please listen to us. We need the statute of limitation gone because even if someone, think about this, if someone takes your loved one away from you 10, 12 years ago unjustly, put their body in a garbage, beaten all over, you mean to tell me because 10, 12 years went by and you come with substantial evidence to prove that this murder did occur, that you can't go back and collect those damages? That is not fair to the families and the people in the community. So that is the recommendation that I am asking for, and I believe that these other families are asking for as well, as well as that there's an investigation done outside of the BCA. They don't need another dollar to help the police cover up these murders, because that is exactly what they are, cover-ups. Right. My story sounds unreal, doesn't it? But it's what I've lived. It's what I've lived. It's what my 13-year-old son lives. He knows what happened to his father. And there's substantial evidence that proves and shows that the St. Paul police murdered my son's father. The BCA helped him cover it up. The officers are still out there to kill more people. They're walking free. They've been walking free for the last 10 years. And we need you guys to be human enough to change what we know in our hearts is right. Hello, everyone. My name thank is you, Ms. Gerwin. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gerwin. Yeah. Come sit where I'm sitting. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Why don't you sit? Thank you, Ms. Gerwin. We we did have a, a opportunity a couple of days ago to sit. Um, it was a very painful conversation and. Um, I, uh, it takes a lot of courage to be here uh, to share your pain uh, with us. My name is Matilda Smith, and I thank Welcome you all for Smith. having me today. My son's name was Jaffrey Smith, and he was murdered by four police, four St. Paul police. Jaffrey Smith, this is so hard. I mean, this is a horror story. My son was killed, was shot 49 and 52 times with his pants pulled down, thrown out like a piece of garbage behind someone's house. Now, you can say that it was, um, it was a, a great kill. You can say whatever you want, but you and I both know that this was an overkill and it wasn't right. Now, BCA handled this case. What I want to know is when are you all going to stop letting the police investigate the police? The police investigating the police is just like me investigating my own child. That's what it is. It's not right, and it's not fair. And BCA lied. They lied to me, and they always lie. And they go out and kill, too. This is not policing. Real police don't go out and kill. They don't go out and hunt like animals and throw bodies out like garbage. They don't do that, not real police, because I come from a family of police. My oldest brother is a police. He made detective. His children are police. I got families of police in, in Chicago. So I know what policing is like. And this is not it. They don't go around killing people. And they don't go around hunting. I, when this happened to me, I woke up. After BCA came and gave me their lives, I woke up the next morning and I walked outside and I really felt like I was in a twilight zone. I looked at everyone. 
and everything. And everything kept going. Kept going like it goes on every day, like nothing ever happened. I looked at everyone in this place like, are these people crazy? I looked. And when I pass a police officer, I have anxiety attacks. Because it wasn't right. I'll never get over what they did to my son. It'll never go away. This will be the fourth year, and it feels just like yesterday. You can't go around here killing us. And you can't put a limitation on the statutory of you killing us. Because there is no limit. And we're not going away, and we're never going to stop fighting. Because it's not right. How many of you ever had to look over your shoulder? How many of you ever had to worry about going outside being killed? My son was always worried about that, and I was too. Because what happened to Marcus Golden, Jamar Clark, Philando Castile? I sat both my sons down and talked to them. I didn't want them to go out. I didn't want them to go anywhere, which was not fair. And BCA, don't ever come to my door and beat my door down like that again and scare me to death. Don't you ever. And don't ever walk in there with a smirk on your face and tell me about how many times you all shot my son. Matter of fact, don't ever send BCA to me again. Send a counselor, because that's what I needed. When you break news down to people like that, that's what they need. They don't need no smirker coming in there, smiling in their face, bragging about how they shot the son up. Get rid of your statutory. Get rid of that three year. You get rid of it because we're not going anywhere. You kill our kids. You kill our loved ones. You took their life. I lost a mother. I lost a father. I lost a sister. Wasn't anything like this. They died of natural causes. It's easy to let it go. It's easy to get past a natural cause death. It is never easy to get over your loved ones being taken away from you that way. Shot 49 and 52 times. That picture would never go away of him, of somebody putting him on Facebook, laying in the back of that yard with his pants pulled down, shot up that way. And when I go to the funeral home and count all those bullet holes in my son, in both hands, in the back of his head, in his chest area, oh, oh, after they shot him 49 to 52 times, one of the officers went to the car and got the shotgun and came over and stood over him with a shotgun and shot him in his chest. And if you guys expect me to be all right from that, no, never, never. I'll never get over this. Mentally, my family, no one would get over this. Jaffer was loved by many. His friends won't get over this. Jaffer had four families. They won't get over this. Jaffer had a wife that had a nervous breakdown after this. And she was arrested for them killing her husband. They come at her. Jaffa Smith had a son. Not only did he have a son, he had a granddaughter. Jaffa Smith had a family and loved ones that loved him. And he, he didn't deserve this, nor did we. Also, the officer, one of the officers that murdered her son actually lives and is the security in her building on the, in West St. Paul. 
So to add insult to injury, she see we actually when I dropped her off one day, he was he stared right at me, one, the, the, one of the officers that was involved in the shooting of her son. So she sees him on the elevator. She sees him in the building. In the washroom, everywhere I go, I have to see him. But guess what? I don't blame him. I blame the system. I blame this capital and everybody in it for allowing this to happen to my son and all of us. The training. See, those police didn't train themselves. Somebody trained them to kill. And you know what else? What I know now, why, is because Minnesota is the second most racist city in the United States. So that was all I needed to hear right there. That was all I needed to hear. I don't need to hear anything else. Your departments are embedded with white supremacy, and they're going out killing our people. It's got to stop. We're not going to stop fighting. It's got to stop. We're not going to stop fighting. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Are there others um, that testify as well? Some changes. Uh, and we're going to try to move the questions okay. so relatively am. soon as well, but please, yes. I am Monique Colors Doty. I'm a Black Lives Matter activist as well as Twin Cities Coalition for Justice Leader. I am a well, member. I am the aunt of Marcus Golden, who was killed by St. Paul Police in 2015. And as I expected, I am completely underwhelmed with this report. I did attend the initial meeting, and in that initial meeting, I also... Uh, what Tashira mentioned, spoke about removing the statute of limitations for police homicides. This is the same thing that was done with a Catholic church here in Minnesota for the victims that were coming forward years later. We've also seen it done with sexual assault cases now in states. Legislation has been passed, and that's the same that we can do here that provides the victims, families, an opportunity to retain lawyers because lawyers want to make money when they work. So while some people, such as myself, moving forward, I don't care about the money, but they need to be able to recruit and get the truth out, particularly for people such as Tashira's fiance, who was killed in a time before Black Lives Matter when she didn't have people to advocate for her to come out and to protest and get these, this out into the streets. So if we look at, starting at the first page on the foreword, we see the discussion, as Harrington talked about, the impact on officers. I think that's a wide brush stroke to paint that their lives are just changed forever. I'm sure there are some officers who are in situations where they had to shoot. But I do know that there's a video of Rich McGuire who killed Phil Quinn in St. Paul when he's asked, how do you feel after killing Phil Quinn? He said, it's good to be me, I feel good. So we need to keep in mind, that's not the experience, that we have officers who kill and kill again and are promoted and embraced. And these homicides are often covered up with the evidence altered, video destroyed and whatnot. So it makes it very difficult. So that thin blue line is not gonna be broken, which is why when you put together a panel of people to talk about and re make recommendations for this, it does not make sense that you have the people that are upholding the system, they're not gonna break that thin blue line to make real change, which is why as I advocated at the initial meeting, write the legislation to hold the police accountable, and when they start going to prison, when they have man mandatory sentences for things such as deleting evidence, removing recordings, planting evidence, then that's when you'll see a change. So many of you, if you don't have children, you may have a pet. You train your children to do certain things. You train your pet. If your pet tears something up and it's little, you put it in the kennel because you want that dog to behave better in the future. When you have children, why do you discipline your children? You discipline your children because their behavior is unacceptable. And as long as police are not facing any type of consequences, then their behavior is completely acceptable, regardless of this piece of paper right here because their behavior is still being covered up and accepted by their departments and the people who are the administrators over them and the police 
federations, not unions, as reported in this paper. There is no union that will recognize the police as unions. <clears throat> That's why police have federations, because the police are the ones who have worked against the working class. The police are the ones who came out and killed people in uprisings when the working class was fighting for a five-day work week and an eight-hour work day. So the police are not recognized as union members. They are federations. So please correct that as you move forward in printing this document. The entire document, though, as it talks about the recommendations using the post board, 1.11, uh, I've been to a post board meeting, and I saw a man standing there saying, I've been coming to you for 10 years. I need help. My neighbor is connected with the police, and they are terrorizing me. And they had done nothing. He was begging for help. And when I stood up and I said, if you turn your back on your own, this is a white man, what will you do for the black community? Absolutely nothing. So now the post board is being embraced and incorporated into this. The post board, which does nothing, it's only held, I believe, as Michelle Gross had pointed out one time, two police officers were reprimanded. They were from Wisconsin, and they had done something against Minnesota officers. Am I correct in that? So we have to look at the police board's history, the work that they've done as well. Your recommendation 1.3, a family liaison, that translates to me as an informant. I know when my nephew was killed, the police wanted to send a chaplain from the police department, and I kept telling her no. What they want to do is get information. They want you to confide and build trust and then take that information and use against you. So never will I ever advocate for a family liaison who's getting a check from the police department or law enforcement. They will be loyal to where that check is, just like every police officer is loyal, and they do not break that thin blue line even when they see something is wrong. 1.4, that I discussed, that's where the error is with the police union and federation. 5, 1.5, rec that recommendation, promote healing and restoration and what you call highly charged incidents. Highly charged incidents are really police executions. They're highly charged because of people come out and respond in force and in numbers. This is an attempt just to keep the lid on that. If you don't want us out protesting and shutting down freeways and streets, then begin to hold your police accountable. Not just for someone such as Justine DeMond. Everyone should have what Justine DeMond had. That should not be an isolated case. Your uh, 2.3 law enforcement agencies are trained to de more in de-escalation tactics. The problem with your de-escalation training is that it is outward facing. Your de-escalation training needs to be inward facing and the officers need to be able to control themselves and their behavior. Recommendation 2.6, officers and dispatchers should have skills to recognize and respond appropriately to people with developmental, whatever, whatever, issues. I got it. What we need are those recordings to be preserved automatically. Anytime someone calls dispatch, those families should have access to everything that they need to move forward with the lawsuit automatically. Just turn it over if you want to help families. 3.1. The BCA is given the authority to investigate. We've seen that has been very useless for us in terms of getting accountability. The efforts are useless. Uh, 3.2, Attorney General and the Minnesota Council, County Attorneys Association should continue working together to discuss and develop ideas how the Attorney General's office can be supportive. Stop talking and write the legislation. That's all you have to do. These community meetings, talk, talk, talk. You don't need to hear about all these cases, especially if you're an officer or if you've been a chief of a police department. You know what to do. This is just more pandering and trying to make it look like you're really doing something. But this has no teeth. This package has no teeth at all. I can't imagine. You have a, a, a family victim liaison you're supposed to trust that person. If you want them to talk to somebody, then you give them a voucher where they can get the counseling and the help they need wherever they need it. But it shouldn't be connected to the police departments or their employees.
reviewing the use of forest standards. Number four, I think Michelle Gross and Communities United Against Police Brutality have really given solid directive for that. And in terms of um, who comprises board and the, the committee that put this together, the fact that Michelle Gross, who is well known in the law enforcement community, was not a part of that, says right there that this was never meant to have any forward movement. So I am um, thoroughly, this I, this is, I think this is just completely disgraceful that there has even been talk that this would be used as a national model. We will never have police doing the right thing, what they have to do, until they know that there's a chance that they might go to jail, that if they are caught per uh, act of perjury, that it's mandatory. They need to see some mandatory prison guidelines set up because there's other things that the police are doing. Everyone, everyone's not, you know, not killed. Many people survive, but those officers continue to go on, live on, on the forest, collect their check, and get paid. Well, families are left devastated and traumatized. So this, to me, you can throw this out and start again. And you want to have some real change, then you have people who know what they're talking about at the table. All uh, because someone's family member may have been caught on video does not make them an expert. You need some different people to get together and talk about what happened. If you want to have somebody that's working as a community liaison, then what you need to do, you just give them the packet. All they need to do is give the packet this information that they need, and they can work from there, let the people know, have the legislation in place. You will have everything that you need as the information comes up, everything your lawyer will need. You don't have to request it. We're giving it to you. We're going to remove the $300 fee to make sure that you have a trustee assigned for the case. You would let the people know right then, you're going to need a trustee to move forward. Here's the information. Fill this out. We're going to expedite this for you so you can have some forward movement. But these aren't the things that we see happening. So we're going to leave out of here with the situation with this paper the same way it was when this committee started writing it. And then there, there were many people on here with uh, great uh, academic achievements. That means nothing if you have not really talked and communicated with the family members to know and understand what happens. When you begin to hold police accountable, when they cannot just use their media access to promote lies. When you also begin to hold county prosecutors accountable for the cover-ups. Hashtag free Mayan Burrell. Give a shout out to him. Yes. As long as we have the systems in place where at every step where accountability could be created, they continue to hold that thin blue line, we will never have change. So start prosecuting these prosecutors and the police. Start firing people. Stop allowing officers to commit crimes, retire, and receive their full benefits, and then all of a sudden, the investigation stops because they're no longer employed. If I worked at a bank and I robbed the bank, I couldn't, I couldn't resign, and the investigation stopped. No, they're going to want their money, and I'm going to jail. It should be the same thing with the law enforcement. So there's a lot to be done, a lot of work that goes much further beyond this piece of useless paper. I think there is a lot of work uh, to be done. I'm sorry, I didn't get your last name. I apologize. Monique Colors Doty. Colors Doty. Uh, you know, members uh, and to the public, uh, this is uh, an unusual hearing. Um, I have, uh, you know, typically the way, you know, I function here <clears throat> because we have a lot of work is that we move things uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we try to have pretty deep uh, conversations by moving quickly. Uh, but it's always a tough balance, you know, between moving uh, forward with work, but also uh, truly listening. And uh, this is unique enough for me because I, I, I am acknowledging uh, that I see you, you. You are people who have lost loved ones. Uh, that isn't often the case. Um, um, we occasionally will have folks who come and testify who have been victims themselves, who are survivors, uh, or have lost uh, others. And we typically slow down um, 
uh, in order to truly hear. Um, and so um, we've gone over the time that I wanted to. Uh, we spent a little bit more time um, uh, with this uh, group of family members than we did with uh, the AG and the DPS uh, folks. Uh, absolutely, and that's what, and that's what I'm saying. Um, and, um, and I need to keep moving forward in order for us to push through laws. Uh, I am hearing a lot of ideas here. Um, there's an idea particularly around the statutes of limitations that I think we could find a lot of good political common ground just out of fairness. And I really appreciate your testimony about that ain't new. You know, we, we've done that for others uh, in other situations as well. Um, I would not have known that if I had not listened here, and Tanisha, you and I had this conversation uh, as well. But I do want to keep moving forward, um, and the next stage of our, our <coughs> process is to do some uh, quick questions and answers. Uh, I think we still have the commissioner here, um, um, who, yes, who could ask uh, uh, questions as well. Um, and then um, uh, we're not, we don't have a bill before us on this. We're not moving the AGs. Uh, recommendations. We're listening to both community members and the AGs as we shape the laws in response to the people. Um, so let me start with Representative Dean. Um, uh, Chair Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank all of you for your testimony today. Uh, I have actually begun work around uh, removing the statute of limitations for officer-involved shootings and killings. You are correct that we have made <coughs> changes to our laws in the past several years for other incidences, whether it's clergy or whether it's individuals that commit sex assault and other types of things. And it's time that we start looking at um, our officers and that accountability is not something that expires. It's something that actually continues. And... I'm not going to apologize for this place. This place is a very, very odd, <laughs> an odd environment and how we do things. And uh, as someone who sat here now for seven and eight years, I feel your frustration, not just for what you're going through, but sometimes we get really frustrated in this way this place works. Uh, and it's real complicated and I'm not trying to make excuses, complicated in our abilities to actually make those changes, but that should not stop us from using our voices to talk about the things that we know are right and the changes that should happen here. So um, my apologies to all of you that have lost loved ones, and I have a few connections to a couple of you relative to the district I represent. And uh, again, thank you for coming here and using your voice. And we'll, at least I, I'll continue to fight to make sure that there is accountability and we actually get this closer to right than we currently have it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you, Chair Dean. Um, Representative Law, I believe you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question was for, for Commissioner Harrington, but I can uh, do it's that quite, another time. It's quite all right. I have a question for the commissioner as well. Uh, Representative Johnson, you want to jump in before the uh, question comes up? Uh, my question was also for the commissioner, oh, but well. I did uh, want to uh, thank the testifiers. Its stories are heartbreaking, um, but we need to move on. And thank you, uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, commissioner Harrington. Yes, Uh, Representative Long. Thank you, Commissioner, and um, thank you to the family members who came forward to, to share your stories. They're um, difficult to hear, and I know it must be very difficult to share um, and uh, get up and speak about such personal and difficult uh, subjects. Uh, the two questions I had, Commissioner, were um, the I've uh, heard from the families of victims uh, in my community in particular about um, mental health for police officers and wanting to make sure that police officers are um, the, their best selves when they come to work and aren't uh, in a position where they might make a snap decision based on their own um, 
own uh, uh, mental health uh, concerns. Um, I'm curious about uh, action steps 5.15 and 5.16 that were in here about uh, um, improving uh, confidential mental health screenings. Um, what types of, what are the next steps in this regard and what types of resources do you think would be needed to implement these recommendations? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Long, the, the testimony that we received what came from really two different sources. One, uh, we had the Plymouth Police Chief who came in who does regular mental health screening with his officers. Um, and that those mental health screenings are done with a licensed and trained therapist. Uh, and therefore, those screenings are uh, underprivileged because they're essentially therapeutic and they're medical screenings the same way any other medical screening would be. The other testimony we received was from a group that talked about being uh, confiding in what they call peer counselors or peer-to-peer -peer groups. Uh, with peer-to-peer -peer groups, they do not have any privilege. And one of the concerns that was raised was that when an officer confides in a peer, uh, that that may in fact have uh, be actionable on a personnel level, and that that would be a disincentive from the officer seeking help rather than an incentive. And what we talked about was how would we incentivize officers who might have mental health issues, whether it's PTSD or others, we want them to make sure that they're getting the help that they need. And so a, some level of confidentiality from, for peer to peer uh, became one of the recommendations that we came out with. Thank you. Mr. President uh, Long. And the uh, second question I have is uh, around uh, recommendation 3.2, the um, continuing conversations around the Attorney General's uh, involvement, um, and maybe maybe uh, would be a better question for the Attorney General's office. It might well be, <laughs> so. The, um, this is an area I know other, other states have had uh, success with uh, in developing an uh, independent prosecutor or special prosecutor model. That's something that I've been uh, looking into, and I'm curious if you could just update the committee on the conversations that have been had and what the next steps are here. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Deputy, Long, uh, um, there was quite a bit of discussion in the group regarding proposals like that. And there was, um, quite frankly, um, pretty strong opinions kind of on both sides. There were a lot of people in the group that felt like when it came time to evaluating investigations, making charge, making determinations on charges in ultimate prosecution, that it ought to be an officer, an entity that is completely independent of the law enforcement agency involved, that doesn't work with that agency on a day-to-day -day basis in um, all the other crimes that that agency investigates. So, you know, an, an office like the Attorney General's office or an office, you know, a special prosecution office has been, as has been proposed in the past. So there were a lot of people that felt pretty strongly that um, that, that should be the model. On the other hand, there was uh, sentiment by some members of the group that local control um, is, is the model that we currently have and is, the, and is the model that we should have in Minnesota. There were a lot of Folks, there were there were some members that felt that the communities involved were entitled to have those incidents evaluated and potentially prosecuted by the county attorneys that they elect within the community. And so, you know, as you might imagine, in a group with such diversity of ideology, the group just wasn't able to come to a consensus on that issue. Um, what I can say for the Attorney General's office, you know, the current state of the law is that, that we can help with that review and we can potentially help with the prosecution, but only if the county attorney asks us to, only if it's referred to us by the county attorney. Um, and if a county attorney doesn't want to do that, we have no authority to oversee that county attorney's decision or to step in and do a prosecution. Um, you know, we stand willing to willing to um, willing to help and willing to participate in any way that the legislature sees fit. 
certainly. Um, you know, the Attorney General Ellison made it very clear that he's not going to shy away um, from these kinds of incidents if the legislature determines it's appropriate for the Attorney General's office. Um, I would add that we do, we currently do as much as we can for, a, for county attorneys. We help with prosecution, sex offender commitments, criminal appeals, and our resources are limited in that area. So any kind of change in the authority of the Attorney General, we would help, we would hope comes with uh, resources so we don't have to take away from other areas where we help county attorneys. And the other thing I'd say, um, which I think is reflected in the recommendation, is that we want to work together with county attorneys um, to, to participate in these kind of cases in a way that's beneficial to the counties um, and that where we can lend our expertise to those county attorneys. But we don't want to necessarily take that authority away from them if they don't want us to have it. And so what we came up with in the group was that we're going to continue our discussions with county attorneys um, to talk about ideas in which, uh, in which our office can assist as much as we can and, you know, which may or may not result in proposals to the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Representative uh, Johnson, and if we can have the answers, uh, both the questions and responses as short as possible, uh, we still have a, a, an agenda I want to get through uh, before we're scheduled to adjourn here today. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, Commissioner Harrington, this got two quick uh, questions for you. Um, first of all, you talked about the body cam issue. Uh, the State Patrol is one of the larger departments in our state, and they do not have body cam. But I'm just wondering if you're in, considering getting them for those officers, because I know they've been, in, especially in greater in, in Minnesota, they're assisting the sheriff's office and the police departments on a lot of these calls where these high emotional incidents do happen. Mr. Chair, Representative Johnson, yes, uh, we have looked at that. We, in fact, have uh, begun the study process to figure out what the cost would be for that, and then also proposed a policy that would have to come before you for approval uh, as the governing body for the State Patrol, and we are in the, the final stages of having that ready. Uh, Representative Johnson, I'm about to recess us. The other committee needs to... Uh, okay, I just uh, have one, just one, one quick question. Very quick, quick for the please, commission. thank you. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, I was just informed this morning, in fact, uh, from uh, one of the sheriffs in northern Minnesota, not, not so much with this bill, but you brought it up, and that's the training. Um, apparently, Hibbing Community College has, be, has stopped all law enforcement con continuing ed training, and that's where most of the departments up in the Arrowhead region used to go for their training. I'm hoping you can work on that and uh, get the officers the training they need back there again. Otherwise, they're coming, driving from... Grand Rapids and Ely all the way down to the Metro for some of the training. Mr. Chair, Representative Johnson, I wasn't aware that Hibbing had discontinued that, and I will be happy to work with the Post Board uh, and with the Higher Ed Department to make sure that, uh, that we do that. One of the things that we recognize as we were talking about training as part of the working group is the necessity for us to have regional training so that officers would be able to do this in a timely fashion. Very well. Um, Representative Muller, you had something? But, oh, uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, Super personal. fast. Um, thanks to the families, and I think there might have been even someone else who was planning to testify, so right. I don't know if we'd have the opportunity to hear again or have another, um, just a hearing like that. And then my, my question is, um, I heard you about the reparations, and I just wondered if that was something that the, um, the working group had, had talked about at all, and maybe you can answer offline, but I, I'm interested to follow up on the reparations piece. Well. Mr. Mottler, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we would be happy to have a conversation about that. A current, current state law does not allow for reparations for someone who has committed a crime. And so if they are adjudicated to have committed a crime, then that would put them outside of, the, uh, outside of consideration for crime victims' reparations. Uh, but we're hoping that with the ad addition of the, the victim family liaison, that we'll be able to find other sources of support for families who are going through this. Very well. Members, uh, until uh, 6 p.m. this evening, this committee stands uh, in recess. We're going to reconvene in the basement uh, meeting hearing room in the, at the state office building. Until then, we are in recess.